of the Tidal program with Signal Film and Media, which is Arts Council funded. Um, so today the performance is just going to happen inside that room. We're sat in the round. It's an hour long performance that's a speculative fiction short story about the day a final submarine launches from a coastal peninsula. It's got video and sound um, performance happening alongside it by Nuria, who is in the space now, and she will have already started performing when you enter. Um, so the event also is being recorded here and inside, so we kind of ask that everyone turns off their phones, mutes their phones and everything, and to not take pictures during it, just because people we'll have those pictures anyway to share with you. Um, so before we go in, like a bit about the research behind it, I really love sci-fi and speculative fiction. I feel like it's this medium where you can be really playful and you ask these sort of like what if questions. So it's kind of like what if this happens then this and you can just take hypothetical things and let them run their course without them being tied to kind of like the bulkiness of real life. So for this it was like what if and obviously this is very specific to here. What if you live somewhere where the industry is getting all tied to one specific area? And then what happens if that area leaves? And also sort of what happens both from an employment and environmental perspective if you can't see a future in where you live? And so that's the kind of two like what if questions that the piece is based around. And it takes the form of, yeah, a speculative fiction sort of story from all these different perspectives within the peninsula. Um, yeah, sorry, onto my second slide. Um, I wrote it over last summer and autumn, and then in December, Nuri and I did the Tidal um, Digital Artist Development Lab with Signal, and through meeting at that and then an opportunity to kind of propose the piece to Signal, we've developed this um, collaborative performance together. So this was, for me, an opportunity to push the work to um, do it as a reading to an audience, which I've not done before. And for Nuria, it was to experiment with live sound mixing and also using different mic objects and things like that. Um, okay, so I think that's it. Thank you so much, everyone, for coming. This is like, awesome to have you here. I'm really grateful. Um, so when we go in, it will already be playing. The room's quite dark, but it's usually it's not too bad. So yeah, it's you um, However you want to... Listen because people listen in different ways. If you just want to sit with your eyes closed and kind of just take in the sound, do that. If you want, there's the projection in the middle, you can watch that, you can watch the readers. And also on all the chairs, we put stones because I find, well, we all find and it relates to the story. Being able to handle something when you listen and just sort of like play with it in your palm is a really nice feeling as well. So you've got all those different ways. Just take seat when you come in. The only seat that you can't go for is not a walk but one where I will be sat. Everything else is just up for grabs, so go wherever. Yeah, thank you very much. Just up your stairs and the door.
They stand, five small bodies side by side, chins resting on arms draped over the railings. Up close, the black metalwork is speckled, burnt orange and patches along the surface where rainfall has pooled each afternoon. No cars pass over the bridge onto the dead end island. It leads nowhere. They watch the water below intently, heads unmoving, hair fluttering over shoulders, over high collars of stiff uniforms. They wait for the others to return from the beach with the stones. Below, the small boat, with its single bench for rowing broken, lurches and dives at the end of its tether, pulled taunt by the high tide. The edges are barely breaking the surface now. The front tips lower where the rope drags it down. Another wave laps over, settling amongst the seaweed and silt arranged over its floor, a miniature landscape. They think it will only take two or three large stones to tip the balance fully, send it sinking into the channel below. A seagull lands on its stern. The girl, furthest on the left, inhales sharply. Maybe this will do it. The boat pushes lower, settles. The seagull alights. They wait. The New Shipyard Cafe, part one. In the afternoons, they meet at the New Shipyard Cafe. The shipyard was a tea room, oiled wooden tables, stone slab floors rounded by years of continuous tread, stairs bowed in the center. Great gold canisters of tea lined the back wall, each in a numbered alcove. The sign said the canisters had been in constant use since 1868. That was as much as they could tell from the large photograph of the shipyard that coated the windows at the front of the empty shop. As soon as you got close to the surface, it lost fidelity, blurred, then disintegrated into an abstract series of dots. All along the high street, shops like this started appearing again, obscuring the hollow interiors of the cavernous vacant retail units behind. The shipyard was never here. It was in a town ten miles away that no longer existed. That didn't seem to matter, though. Their shipyard is an unmatched collection of chairs around two pine tables found at the skip. They laboriously chipped off some of the photograph at the top of the windows to let a shaft of daylight through and wedge the door shut with a broken head of a rake when they leave in the evenings. The blue carpet floor is moulded unevenly from the decades of football. The white tiled ceiling is sparsely scattered with light panels, all broken. One in the back corner would flicker every few months. They like to pretend it's a sign. Jay spins slowly in the office chair at the head of the tables, pushing himself on with each orbit. Two unopened bottles of wine sit ceremoniously in the centre of the tables. When will they be here? He asks again. The beach. At the crest of the dune, she pauses. The folded paper in her hand shifts occasionally in the wind, drifting up from the sea. The tide is coming in. She looks down at the printed map. In spidery ink, the engineer at the mast had circled this place. You can see all the way down to the power tote station, across the estuary to the south, he had said. To the north, here, he pointed across another estuary. Up here, you've got another one, decommissioning now. And then you can turn around and look back towards the town, and you've got the warehouses they construct the subs in. All from that spot, he said, handing the print out back. She's here now, and it is true, all from this spot. She felt rude trying to connect him, correct him. She was trying to find a place where none of these things were visible. A place where you could convince yourself was wilderness or an almost wilderness. She knows it doesn't exist anymore, but likes to imagine. Life is slowing, incrementally, she feels. Every year, shifted around, a new post in a new place she's never been before, each time smaller than the last. She realized eventually that nothing existed outside the cities anymore, but realized too late. The town's emptied. She's moving in the opposite direction to the flood of people. She calls her family back in Mumbai before arriving at the peninsula. They warned me the signal's bad, it's down most of the time, so I thought it's would speak to you now. Why are they even sending you? Her sister laughed. She tried to laugh as well, but only felt a hammering dread in her chest. She folds the map back into the pocket of her trousers. The wind combs across the beach, creating a swirling mist just above the grey sand. Further along, three uniform clad girls search among the larger stones left stranded up the beach by the last receding tide. She bends as well, scooping the finer sand in her palm letting it run through her fingers. It catches on eddies of air and is cast through, through the long fonts of wiry dream grass, which stretches out to the estates in the far distance. The football pitch. The breath aches in his lungs and the skin on his face feels like a mask, red hot and prickly. He drifts to the edge of the field, 
The game continues without him. Shouts and the rhythmic thud of the ball. He hears rushed footsteps and almost falls forward as he's slammed into. An arm squeezes around his shoulders, comfortably resting down. He's still a head shorter than most of the boys on the, on the team. The gap continues to grow. Stop daydreaming now. The words are laughed into his ear as he's spun around. Their names are shouted across the pitch. Quick staccato, one, two. You part of this game, get to it. The arm across him is lifted. Yet the weight lingers on. The moment crystallizes. He hopes he remembers it. If he collects enough points like this, he thinks, they will stop the ball from shifting so relentlessly. They will pin him down. He's not part of anything. He's slipping out of the current. He's out of time with, wake up. It's shouted again, more insistently. He starts forward. He wonders if he'll always feel like this. The stone heap. The soft sediment crumbles precariously beneath her uneven steps. Occasionally, she ends up lurching forwards, grasping onto the rising ground for purchase as it gives way at the foot. The dust clings to her clothes, to her hair. It works today into the ridges of her fingertips and between the laces of her boots. She can see the summit a little way above. The sky behind it, usually milky, is darkening. It rains every day at almost the same time, cascading down at quack droplets, falling in sheets for 20 minutes, half an hour, before subsiding as abruptly as it started, leaving the town gleaming, saturated, shining, and the air tasting metallic. Then the sky empties and becomes yellow-white once more. She should have kept track of the time. The already quiet streets emptied completely as the dark clouds flood in from the west. Even as a small child, she knew to seek shelter as the sky changed, learning fast once those first stinging drops fell onto her freckled arms, sour and biting. She looks around. She won't, she won't make it back town in time to shelter before the rain hits. She continues to climb. The argument started as usual. It was about nothing and therefore everything. Her mother circled the table, laying down plates with the exact tombra that spelt trouble. Her auntie spat words from between clenched teeth. She pulls on her sister's denim jacket and walks out the front door, gently pulling it shut so that it made only a slight click behind her. She tugs at the sleeves again, trying to stop it bunching around her elbows. It clings uncomfortably. The label rubs her neck. Why she never cut it out? She crosses the ridge and is standing on the flat summit. She looks south towards the town centre, the parallel lines of terraces. She tells herself she can see her home amongst them. She tells herself she will go back soon, in time to go to the docks with them. The rain starts. The museum. The glass ceiling above reverberates with the drone of a thousand heavy droplets. She doesn't remember it starting, but now she's noticed the loud thundering she struggles to concentrate on the board before her. She already knows it word for word. The exhibitions in the museum never change. Now, though, the sentences feel disjointed. As her eyes scan the text, the phrases refuse to open up to link to things to create images in her mind. She finds her heavy school bag head weighing on her shoulder and shifts it to the other side. She crosses into the next room. A large map on the right of the door shows a floor plan of the museum. You are here, in bright red letters, is labelled in the centre of a rectangular roof marked geography. They were allowed to leave school early today. The morning passed in eager expectation of the afternoon. Now the afternoon is here and the excitement is sapped from her. A class rushed off to their scattered homes, promising to see each other at the dock later for the launch, the last launch. After lunch, an unsettling nausea inhabited her stomach and refused to loosen its grip. Even now, she can't face going home. The inevitable bickering, then the inevitable bustling, shunted out of the house and over to the launch in a crowd of her youngest siblings. She loses the sense of being herself at home, or whatever of herself she's named at 12. She feels growing a distinct sense of self that's becoming increasingly hard to relinquish. It's diminished each time she returns home. She counts down the years till she can leave. She looks up at the display again. Tired plastic cutouts show the formation of natural water features, estuaries, glacial lakes. An illustration details how oxbow lakes are created, meandering rivers winding ever further into their banks, bending, gorging, and splitting into a more direct course. They leave behind a curved lake, isolated from the main path of the river. She glances, she places the tip of her index finger 
at the heart of the blue plastic cutout of an Oxbow Lake. You are here, she mouths. The Home Finance Cafe. The cafes are everywhere now, everywhere except where they should be. The department store cafe seem reasonable for things. Expected even. Garden centre cafe, the leisure centre cafe, fine. Then came the garage cafe, the optician's cafe, the bike shop cafe. How did it come to this, he wonders, sat in the home finance cafe. They agreed to meet here because it was exactly halfway between their houses, no man's land. Her sour voice asked, you know home finance? It was in one of the brief spells when the signal had been back up. Something in his chest constricted as a name, capitalised and surnamed, lit up on his phone. She had been mum for years now. He felt, still, that he should visit her more frequently, for penance or ritual of guilt. His brother never went anywhere, anymore, not since the new child. His father was out all the time. He should see her more, he decided, as he sat stirring a sad latte, waiting. We only had one mother, his sister said last week, squeezing his arm, distracted partially by something outside the window behind him. It felt like an obvious thing to say. You should see her more. She's getting on in years. Should he? He decided to believe her. The top of the latte settled into a pale brown froth. There was no stirring left to do. Instead, he fiddled with a sugar packet, a dark blue tube. He creased it back and forth until it split along the seam, white sugar cascading into his dark trousers. It's now that she arrives, folding away a sodden umbrella. Why do you do that? She stares disdainfully down as he brushes the fine powder to the floor. He's a small child again, just like that. Do you not want to see the launch today, she asks, giving the coffee he pushes in front of her a single stir before sipping. I, I don't. They think this will be the last one. Not like when your father retiring. Is he off there? Who? Dad. Why should I know? Will you be going? I don't agree with it. As he speaks, she raises her eyebrows just slightly at her coffee, giving an impatient hum, and they're off. Estuary Pillbox. The concrete pillbox is stranded now, halfway down the western beach. The dunes along the shoreline are a solid grey-green band rising above it, 50 metres away. He watches them through a narrow window in the thick walls. The room is on a slight tilt where it started unevenly into the stand. He tried to get back to the caravan when it rained. He started but was stranded there instead. Spending too long in this tilted place made him feel dizzy. He returns to the window again, but it's still raining. The minutes slip past. He counts the mollusks in a tray that he left by the door. Twelve. Less than last week, only a couple look edible. The rest have that green, grey, yellow, lichen, sprouting along the shelves. He places the tray back down with a sigh. Starting out the low doorway towards the silvery line of the sea he can see. It's cornering the last 
we begin the next hours. He will feel small in this shelter again. He sits with his back against the wall, the damp coolness seeping through his jacket. Even in June, the concrete is eerily cool. He picks up one of the... Sorry. He picks up one of the porous white stones and feels it around the edges of the pillbox. It was discarded by the retreating tides. It is the size of his palm, almost as if it had been created by clay, molded to the palm of his hand. He stretched his legs out on the sandy floor. On the marble above the door, someone had scratched a demand in white splattered drips flickering down the concrete walls. The spotted onto the floor below, the message he'd seen earlier. This way or that, he wasn't sure. He can't remember where he'd seen it. To the picture. He feels the mind skipping through time. Feels sleep pulling. His head forward now. He glances up at the message once more. Before the before his eyes start to close and his chin fall to his high collar with his jacket. His hand falls from his lap to the floor, his palm open, stone still between his unclenched fingers. One foot twitches slightly, then stills. Stop the submarines. Build the bridge, the message says. outside, then stops.
bus stop. The letters roll past, each year losing more meaning. Clusters of the small bulbs, brilliant orange, that make up the narrow sign, burn out, leaving behind an ever more abstract pattern. The letters appearing transformed into something like Morse code. She watches it roll on, back leant against the grey glass of the bus shelter. She imagines she can spot letters in the pattern, five dots at one point that must be an S, something that could be an R or an N. She rubs the front of her jeans with her free hand. They've begun to sting where they're damp from the brief rainfall. In her other arm, she cradles a large flat tube to her body, protective. The sigh escapes her. He's always late. She spends hours waiting. A solitary car grinds down the road beside her, its silvery body reflecting the dark, wet tarmac of the empty street. She follows its slow journey along the uneven road and notices its path overlap with a lone figure walking towards her. He's there after another minute, back resting against the shelter wall opposite, waterproof hood pulled low over his brow. The black fabric of the coat is patched in pale orange, the years of wear out in the rain bleached into it. I'm always waiting, she says, and it's true, she will always be waiting. I tried to call, the signal's still down, he apologises. We should start, I have to be gone before four. He pushes himself up off the bus shelter as he talks taking two long strides towards her, holding out his arms. Fine, she says, and twists off the lid of the tube, shaking the heavy paper out, pale brown pages scavenged from one of the office's buildings by the stone heap, burned from years left lying on vacant desks under the single paned windows, dark blue ink. The stack rests across his outstretched arms, curling down at the edges. You paste up the first ten, he says, appeasing. Then we can switch. She plasters four along the back wall of the bus stop, they stick easily to the glass. As they cross the road to head towards the next bus shelter, they both glance back. Their demand is repeated over and over, and the unused shelter is momentarily alive again. The blue ink, even from this distance, is distinct. Build the bridge, the one that leads out of it, she thinks. The dot, part one. Let's head up that way slightly, she calls back to the other, one hand steering the girl in front of her. She eyes the blue clad figures lining the top of the dock, solemn and perfectly still. Even from this distance, she spots him, slightly taller, waiting to fill out, still an unwieldy teenage body at 19. Ah, there he is, she crouches lower, eyes level with her daughter, arm around her middle. Do you see him, love? Give him a wave. The small hand flies back and forth, excited and expectant, hidden within the gathering crowd. Oh, that's getting busy, isn't it? Give him another wave, hit. I will too. There, I bet he's seen us now. Will he wave back? She circles her small arms above her head. Wave back, wave back. I oh, can't, they've got to stay smart up there. Doesn't he look good? She turns back to her husband. There he is. He gives a solemn wave in the direction of the line of soldiers without pausing his conversation. The restaurant kitchen. The metallic smell drifts through the open doors at the back of the kitchen pulled in by the hot air rising off the industrial ovens. It smells how blood tastes, he thinks. He notices the pastry chef two stations away staring intently at him and turns quickly back to his chopping board. The flesh of the pale white yellow onion is strewn across the marked surface, the colour of the sky, he thinks. He scoops the pieces into his hand and throws them on top of the tub, a large pile growing to his right. No, no, this won't do at all. The voice comes from behind his shoulder and he turns quickly, the next onion held, skin on in his hand. The sous chef's hand comes down into the tub, fingers spread and palm up. He lifts, allowing the chunks of onion to tumble through his fingers. No, this is awful, we can't use any of these. He wonders for a second if the chef is joking. He turns to look at the tub of onions too. Can you not see, says the sous chef, shaking the tub by the rim. Can you not see what's wrong? He shakes his head hesitantly. No chef. Look at these. They're all different sizes, they're all huge chunks, can't use any of these. Well, nobody told me, nobody told you what? If you don't know, then you ask. I didn't know that I didn't know. You have to do them again, all of it, again. As the chef speaks, he picks up the tub and ceremoniously empties it into the open bin. The kitchen is silent, everyone watches. Do it again, but like this. He takes the onion and the knife from him, hands flurrying, blade gliding. Thin slivers fall onto the board. Yes, chef. I what? I actually finished in ten minutes. I'm heading to the dock. My brother is. Do you think someone else should do your work? Do the work you didn't do? No. I. Then what's the issue? 
The chef is already turning away, the spinal column thrown back over his shoulders. Yes, chef. He turns back to the chopping board. The skin on his face feels tight, burnt. He imagines walking out the door, apron on and onions still in hand, walking and walking. He imagines reaching the estuary. The tide is down, even though he knows right now the set is highest. In front of him folds miles and miles of sand, traced with rivulets spotted with the dark specks of birds. He imagines walking, walking all the way across and arriving at the town on the other side. They have buses there. He imagines how far he could get. He's still carrying the onion for some reason, and he sits on the top deck with it balanced in the palm of his hand. He wonders how often his brother will come back once he leaves. Probably a fair bit at first, then less and less as the years pass. He wonders if he'll get to leave, ever. He wonders if he should have joined the Navy too. He imagines being 19 as well. He wonders if they have cooks on the submarines, or maybe they just eat powder. The plastic strips over the door clatter in the lonely gust of wind. The radio recording crackles as the host thanks the previous guest, some man from the council. He's heard this bit before. The man carefully rivers away from all the questions handed to him. He's asked again and again about the new bridge and if there will be a new bridge. A waiter crashes in, shouts table 12, orders away. The time is 3.32 and you're listening to. The pile of onion to his right grows again, finer this time, thin coils of yellow-white translucent. The Grasslands, Part 1. The Grasslands cover the southern half of the island, a strip of land laced with estates that borders the west side of the peninsula. The old bridge crosses the broad channel separating the two. She can see it from here, the black mass of iron and timber hatched with beams. It hangs above the glinting water, the surface the same soft white as the sky above. The tide had swelled as she stood here, leading in from the estuary in a thick mixture of salt and sand. Now, as it slows, reaching its highest point, all the sediment is dropping away, leaving the surface glassy, inviting. She shifts her gaze across to the docks, the furthest thing she can see on the south across the channel. She tells herself she will hear the moment, that even now she can hear the expectant hum of the gathered crowd. She tells herself that the water may rise just a little, displaced. She meanders back and forth along a compacted sand path, the surface uneven and intersected by rivulets. Up as far as the chimney, some old clay furnace that juts out from the foliage banking up to the road above. Down to the skeletal mass of a wrecked fishing boat, rib cage raised up, timber saturated, coated thickly in the brown slick scum that clings to the edges of the water around here. She looks at her watch, 20 to 4. The dock, part two. He shifts his weight to the other foot. It's imperceptible to anyone watching, but brings with it a wave of relief. He keeps his knees slightly bent. I bet you it works, his friend muttered during training. My cousin said, if you lock your knees straight, then you'll faint after a bit. They stood for another two hours in rain, hurling sideways somewhere just in shore on the east coast. No being painted. From under the low brim of his cap, he can see a burst of movement, an arm waving frantically from amid a knot of families further down the dock. He watches, unmoving. She rests a second, nudges the arm of a friend, and waves again. Turns back to stare straight ahead. He tries to ignore the embarrassment climbing up his neck. The aerial mass, part one. He taps his hand to the metal column, once, twice. It's dry enough to climb out. He could wear gloves. He picks them out of the box of the toolbox, a tough canvas and metal rectangle that hangs over his shoulder. The palms of the gloves are coated in a rubbery, dark blue plastic, bright against the pale brown fabric. He discards them after a few seconds' consideration. He slipped once before, only once. He was wearing gloves. He looks down at his hands, reddened from the years outside, numb and cold, hunched over circuit boxes in the biting wind, 
or at the mass while acidic rain still dripped from the metal. He brushes his thumb along his index finger, the burn running red from the joint to the knuckle. He should really stop smoking, he thinks. The aerial mass, part two. He's at the second platform now, level with the slate roofs of the arcade that ward on one side of the square. His hands sting. The swimming pool, part one. The wavering surface of the pool reflects the unearthly light filtering through the windows running along the southern side of the low leisure building. The ceiling above is panelled in dark wood, cedar, he guesses wrongly. He tries to stay afloat with as little effort as possible, circling only his arms and his feet, clockwise, anti-clockwise. His lungs rise, fall, deep slow breaths that you can't hear with the submerged ears. His left side is more powerful. He sees that he's drifting in a circle, just slightly. He's alone in the pool. He's always alone. He watches the clock hump at the far end. The elongated second hand, painted a brilliant red, spins fluidly around. He imagines him racing in his slick bodies and black swimming costumes. He imagines someone watching the clock as intently as he does now, time ticking forward rather than counting back. It's ten minutes to four. He takes another deep breath. The aerial mass, part three. His lungs ache. He climbs the final ladder up to the fifth platform. The contraptions of the mass crowd around him on the small metal gangway. He spreads his arms, he can reach both sides of it. He won't fix the signal today, he already knows this. There are two parts he's waiting on. Until they arrive, he climbs up anyway, loosening bolts, tightening the ones he loosened yesterday. The people below get upset if he isn't up here when the signal is down, he learned, even if he can't fix it. They corner him in the pub. Fingers, prodding chest, demanding. <coughs> he tried to explain, I'm waiting on bouts. The wait seemed to get longer each time something broke. And then crowds of fingers would be leveled accusingly at him, somehow separated from the bodies behind, neighbors he'd known for decades. They were at it again yesterday. Will you get it fixed for tomorrow though? What about the launch? We'll need it fixed for that. He didn't tell them about the parts. He sat gray in the corner of the crowded pub, then sat gray in his empty house. He fell asleep, and the lit cigarette burnt down along the edge of his finger without even waking him. He runs his thumb along it now. He steps forward, resting his arms on the high metal railing, leaning his chin on them. He sees the jostling crowds, like the static of the television screens. He wonders what would happen if they never got signal again. The son of a friend told him that they use recordings in the cafes now, repeating the same radio programs each month falling further and further out of date. He feels some sense of comfort in it. He looks at his watch, almost time. The New Shipyard Cafe, part two. The record clicks slightly as it reaches the center. F leads across. What now, she asks. They all drift over. Voices rise in human disagreement. Well, if you knew better, you'd think he was blind too. It's the same chords over and over. All music, said Jay, is the same chords over and over. Ah, oh, you're full of, they go on, sleeves of worn records scattered around that small group. Beer is brought out at some point from the fridge at the back, a leftover industrial relic. Only a couple before they get here, she says, or they'll feel like they've missed out. He leans back onto the pine table, watching. They pass the records back and forth, examining each as though they haven't seen it a hundred times before. They remain curious, even when nothing changes. They continue to look, when they've seen it all already. Should we move the chairs, she asks. The dock, part three. Another family joins them, the friends from his mother's work. She points to him again, waves, hopefully. His father is patting the shoulder of the other man. They laugh, unheard from this distance. On the gable end of the looming metal warehouse hangs a clock. He imagines it striking down the seconds. It's directly behind his position at the top of the dock. One more figure in the dozens of Navy officers standing at attention, slightly taller than the rest. He is sure this is how his mother spotted him. He resents not blending in. The sea water rising before him is almost over the highest line of the clinging brown water weed. It must be almost four. He imagines the drinks they'll have after this. He imagines heading off down south next week. The whole unit shipped off the peninsula now that the final submarine's complete. He looks at his mother again, a hand gesturing towards him once more, talking animatedly to two new arrivals. He feels guilt twist inside him momentarily. He wonders when he'll next come back. The swimming pool, part two. How has the time already gone? 
10 minutes turn to one, and he watches now as the hand makes its final rotation. He hates it. He imagines it might stop when it reaches the vertical once more, that it recorded all time to be recorded, and now they are beyond. Somewhere else. It's five seconds two. It's one second two. It's the hour. It's 10 seconds past. And there it is. It happened. And time continues as though it's nothing. The world hasn't stopped for them. The world doesn't know about them. He watches it reach the hour again. It's now a minute past four. He rolls onto his front, spanning his arms out as far as they can reach. His gray hair washes forward around his brow, only his broad back rising above the water. He stares down at the tiles shimmering at the bottom of the pool. He imagines the world ending, or imagines this world ending. He wonders if anyone will notice. The swimming pool, part three. He shifts his feet on the narrow plastic step. The man continues to float face down in the pool below. 30 seconds. He watches the second hand drag around. If he makes it to a minute, then he'll climb down, pull him out, he tells himself. Three sharp taps echo across the otherwise silent room. He looks over to the bright windows of the reception and cafe. A figure stands, arm raised, waving at him, hopefully. He waves back with exaggerated boredom. The figure points to the floating body in the middle of the pool. Man is hanging himself. He laughs and rolls his eyes. He spent the summer counting down the minutes till he can leave, leave the whole peninsula behind for somewhere, anywhere. Until then, he hangs suspended over the pool in the towering lifeguard's chair. Every minute drags on, with only the regular visits from art to look forward to, appearing in the cafe window like some strange cloak traveler in his giant black waterproof. A minute. He starts to climb down from his seat. As he reaches the side of the pool, the man rolls over onto his back, his great heaving breath echoing across the room. He looks towards the clock, staring at it solemnly before saying, it's past four. He follows his gaze. Yeah, yeah it is. He edges around the pool to the glass door leading to the cafe. A rush of cold air flows through as he opens it, followed by our spring face. Having fun? Press sense, part two. The carcass of the boat is level with her path again when she hears it. A slight change in sound, as though something unseen and electronic has clicked on in a quiet room. It has happened. She pictures the metal body, dark as a wet stone, dropped into the milky water. She imagines it resurfacing hundreds of miles away, a great held breath, a release. She carries on walking past the scattered bodies of more boats, unearthed and there. She's going to turn back, cross the bridge and wind towards the dock, finding two friends she's already an hour late to meet. She continues south, past the warehouse on the opposite shore, past the final road of the estate. She will walk to the very end of the island, she decides. She imagines seeing the submarine there, the smooth body cresting above the water. She imagines it like the ending shots of a film, perfect and final. She crosses two more reflects. The grasslands around her are marked with small pools of brine water risen from the ground as it becomes saturated by this highest tide, the only tide that the submarine can leave in. Water seeping up through the dark ground she pictures it over and over. At the next rivulet, she pauses, measuring her stride before leaping across. A hand's width from where her right foot lands lies a grey tube, uneven in diameter, thinning to a point at one end. She turns it over with the tip of her boot. It's stiff and heavier than she thought. With its underside to the sky, the fish, some kind of catfish, lies helpless, its wide mouth full of sand, belly a brilliant tender white. She walks on four or five strides before turning back. She can see it exposed against the dark ground around. She returns, tipping it over once more and shifting it under the overhang of a clumped mound of grass.
The swimming pool, part four. He watches them, heads pressed close together, leaning on the same upright of the door frame. He tries to hear their conversation, but the low murmur drifts past him, incomprehensible. He feels more alone than before. He lies his head back into the water, the blood immediately audible in his ears as the water saturates him. His feet and hands move in small circles again. Laughter, loud and warm, floats through to him, then ceases, shushed by the manager hovering in the reception area. He lifts his head slightly. They continue, quieter again. The door to the cafe props shut behind them, blocking out the manager's surveillance. I've got another 20 minutes. I'm on till half past. Leave early. I can't. She's already up with me. I've got, what, two weeks left here? The conversation returns to a murmur. He watches the patterns of light reflected on the panel ceiling from the surface of the pool. Guilt bleeds through him. He lies his ears back underwater, hoping to drown the feeling out. The same guilt grows like bile, making it hard to answer her questions, his mouth tacky. He sat, trapped, beneath the hostile lighting of the radio station recording room. The large headphones cocooned his ears, blocking him in. A single microphone hung before him, like the chrysalis of some giant insect. The radio presenter was bland and encouraging. Prompt smiled at him across the bright pine desk. So, right now, we're waiting on the news. Will the contract be renewed? Many are hoping not, as you know, there's been a lot of anti-nuclear protests. She asked him about the submarines, then she asked him about the bridge. He stumbled his way blindly through the interview, choking. Even though he trod through the carefully rehearsed phrases, he was certain the truth seeped out of him, but no one heard it. He knew the contract wouldn't be extended, that this was the last boat built. Once it drifted away, what would be the point in building a bridge across the estuary? A many, many million pound bridge to a town they decided had nothing in it. He knew the conversation had already happened those hundreds of miles away. There would be no bridge. They were on their own. A clatter of plastic draws his head left. The lifeguard climbs back up to his seat. He sits, head resting, on a clenched fist, uninterested eyes watching the movements in the cafe, waiting to leave. He knew soon they would all be gone. What was there to stay for? She shoots upright on the white plastic chair. Away, away! At the other end of the allotment, the cat darts back through the tangle of brambles and patched fencing bordering the longest edge of the triangular garden. The birds, finches, great tits, blue tits, resume their gentle fluttering around the cluster of feeders in the centre of the four vegetable beds. She, does, she settles back into her chair, tutting, bad cat. She sits at the top of the allotment, her back to the small greenhouse. This spot gets the best of the weak sunlight diffused through constant smog. She can only grow shade dwelling plants everywhere else. She tries to reel back in a line of thought. Where was she at? The vegetable beds. She would need to raise them again. Even from the distance she could see it, on high tide, the salt water rose through the ground, dragged in on the channel, running by just out of sight. At first, it was only on the very highest highs that it reached here, once a year. Now it was each month. Her courgettes were dying. She took it once more and stood slowly, resting her weight on the arm of the chair as she pushed herself up. She would enlist her grandson for help, give him something to do now that the was off. She crossed back and forth along the makeshift brick path, measuring, documenting. Another two feet should see it sorted for the rest of her decades. She's sure. The tide won't rise that much. The new shipyard cafe, part three. The first groups are reaching the high street from the dock now. By the time they reach the shipyard cafe, they are amongst a dense crowd. They linger outside the door, leaning against the wall to the left and waiting for it to quieten before they slip inside. The colour suits you, bizarre, a little too loud. The colour? Yeah, the uniform, like some kind of retro vibe to it. 
He looks away. He forgot to bring a change of clothes after work. He would see the evening out in the garish uniform of the leisure centre. Red polo neck, white shorts, white trainers. Why are we even waiting here? Nobody cares that we're using the shop. It's too busy to go in right now, but nobody cares. The new shipyard cafe part four. They hear R outside, his dry voice cutting through the thick white noise of the unusually crowded street. The colour suits you. G gestures the other over, mouthing, they're here. They gather near the door, sign her form between them. The new shipyard cafe part five. The room glows, invisible from the street, hidden by the artificial shipyard. Along the side walls glisten chains of fairy lights, warm white. As he steps over the threshold, they burst forward. Happy birthday, they chorus. Oh, very nice, he laughs at the sign. Happy birthday, followed by an affectionately called the nickname. Kind of you all. Ah, which is the door shut behind them, with the rake head. He gazes around the room. Oh, not bad, not bad. Would the birthday boy like a glass of wine? She asks. Glasses are brought out, as unmatched as the chairs. He turns towards the back wall, which is empty of lights. A blank white rectangle is lit onto mottled magnolia paint. A projector balances on a stack of records atop the most stable chair. He walks slowly towards it. What's this? A film, she says, handing him the wine. The others start to settle onto the chairs, arranged in an uneven semicircle, branching out each side of the projector. Jay lies on the floor at the front. R rests his feet on him until he's hit the elbow with a shin. What film? I was a surprise, said that. Happy birthday, asked Miles, rising the glass in his direction. Okay, someone hit play. The pop fell in. For the briefest moment, a wave of noise crashing, the roar of the pub washes over him. The door to the smoking area slams shut again, a decades old barrow of chipped paint stemming back that incessant sound. His friend's arm is around his shoulder, heavy. A hand appears before him, his cigarette is lit. He glances down at the green lighter, the worn hand, aged skin, freckled, marked, a burn running along, still red, the index finger. They've seen time pass side by side. His gaze shifts up to the sky again. Think now, he tells himself, remember. Stance like this, sealed in time, 50 years ago, maybe. Two boys on the edge of a football pitch, dark blue jerseys stiff with drying mud. The same arm over the same shoulder, almost. He'd stared up at the warm blue sky, late June, just like now. When did the sky stop being blue, he asked, cigarette resting on his lips, mumbling his words. But them is blanketed, yellow, white, and glowing and empty. He cannot make out the intricacies of individual clouds. There are none. It's flattened, indistinct. Every day reveals the same milky sky. When was the last time the sky was blue, he asks. His friend shrugs, pulls back the draped arm from around his shoulders, turns back to the door. It's always been this way, he says, softly, over his shoulder. The bridge, part two. The next three fall wide as well, plunging into the water around a small boat, displacing the brown water weed that gathers on the surface like an oil slip. One girl swears. Beside her, S crouches down, counting the remaining stones scattered between the damp umbrellas discarded at her feet. You should have brought more, she says. There are only four left. She straightens slowly, the heavy stone pulling her down. Someone else for it, my arms ache. Oh, but we haven't got a feel about how far it is we'll miss. Oh, it doesn't help anyway, the stones are all different sizes. The last three weren't way too wide. I guess. The smooth sandstone switches hands back and forth between soft palms. Finally, it lands on B. She turns in a quick circle between her friends, arms stretched parallel in front of her, the smooth brown stone balanced across them. Can't someone else do it? They all shake their heads, arms pinned intentionally to their sides. She turns back to the river, resting the stone on the rail of the bridge. Fine. They line up once more along the railing, fingers gripping the metal. It's further than you think. She weighs the stone again in her hands, rocking it slowly up and down. A figure passes over the bridge behind them, on the opposite pavement. A seagull wheels overhead, falling to the empty sky. The stone falls through the air, pulled in her heart, and thuds into the shallow water from the base of the boat, close to the helm. As it lands, a great crack splinters the base, sinking up through the curved sides. Water seeps through. They call out. More water is pouring over the sides of the vessel. Brown weeds drag it in with it. The boat sinks in slow motion.
thank you to our readers as well. So we had David, Charlie, Liz, and Megan. I really appreciate you taking part. And um, Miriam, so obviously, the back to you for the Yeah, please come and come and join us. <laughs> 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 